ナモタサバカワトアラハトサンマサンブダサナモタサバカワトアラハトサンマサンブダサナモタサバカワトアラハトサンマサンブダサムダンダマンサンガンナマサミ I thought it could be nice if we do another chant together for anyone who's inclined.、Uh, this is on page 41, the reflection on universal well being in English. And this is a reflection on metta,、uh, on loving kindness, loving friendliness towards ourselves and towards all beings. And then it expands just from the wish of, of metta. This loving kindness to what's called the three other Brahma Viharas or divine abidings. These mature emotions of loving kindness, the first. Then it branches into a wish may all beings be released from all suffering. That's karuna or compassion. Then it goes into the wish may they not be parted from the good fortune that they have attained. This is mudita or sympathetic, empathetic joy. Just the opposite of Schadenfreude, when you're delighting in someone's,、um, yeah, you know, ill, you know, when someone's doing badly,、um, delight, rather than delighting in that, but delighting when other people are, are doing well. And the fourth Brahma Vihara, this divine mature emotion, is、uh, equanimity, and this is the reflection on karma. So we can recite this together. Now let us chant the reflection on universal well being. May I abide in well being, in freedom from affliction, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety. And may they maintain well being in myself. May everyone abide in well being, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety. And may they maintain well being in themselves. May all beings be released from all suffering, and may they not be parted from the good fortune they have attained. When they act upon intention, all beings are the owners of their action and inherit its results. Their future is born from such action, companion to such action, and its results will be their home. All actions with intention, be they skillful or harmful, of such acts, they will be the heirs. Okay. So, a really beautiful chant. It has been chanted since the, the time of the Buddha. The Pali words for that, which are on the opposite page, yeah, have been chanted by monastics since the time of the Buddha. And、uh, yeah, the sense that they're mature emotions,、uh, emotions that people who are mature and、uh, wise are able to see in themselves, cultivate in themselves. These are very, very important. So, This past Thursday, most people will know, was Halloween. It was Halloween. And、uh, you might not know this, but、uh, Halloween is the single day of the year when a monastic is most likely to be asked the question statement What are you supposed to be? A pumpkin? And you just don't know what to say. You just don't know what to say because we wear this outfit every day. And uh, um, so, if anybody is, is new here, 
Um, you might look around and you might look at people and say, oh, this, this looks like a cool group of people. Uh, but you don't yet know. You don't yet know. You haven't yet tested the people here. Uh, but just for more evidence on the coolness of the people here, um, I haven't gotten confirmation of this, but I did know that on Halloween, there was a group of Clear Mountaineers. Those are people who you know, self-affiliate with Clear Mountain, who were going to go out on Halloween to a local graveyard and sit and meditate together and practice recollection of death and eat dark chocolate. Did that happen? <laughs> Did it? Indoors. Oh, okay. Oh, bummer. Okay. Well, maybe some future year. So, but very cool idea. Where else do you find a group of people that gets to eat dark chocolate in cemeteries? Um, yeah, so recollection of death, this is, um, yeah, it is a, a, part of, um, a part of Buddhism, and uh, it really does, yeah, it, it land for some people and it won't land for others, and um, it does take some context to figure out how to hold that, but it really can change the course of your life if you do reflect on it often that actually this life is short and uh, it matters how I'm living and wise people say it'll matter how I die as well. So yeah, I know one monk, actually Ajahn Kachana, um, he did this particular reflection on aging, sickness, death, and separation and karma, the same reflection on karma here. Uh, every day when he was getting his uh, PhD in physics from Berkeley and pretty much it led him more and more in the direction of of a Buddhist life um, yeah this it's a profound question and finding answers within uh, can yeah really surprise you in the direction it'll take you and your your kindness your capacity for kindness and um, yeah the way you live your life so Having touched on this past week, uh, I did feel like it would be important to touch on this this coming week. And um, every so often, we do teach people some Thai words or some Pali words. And we'd like to introduce a Thai word, which is also a Pali word, which happens often, which is Garuna, Garuna, which in Pali means compassion. And it can mean compassion in Thai, but it can also mean please, like please. So karuna, please, if everyone can um, hold each other in this, this really beautiful uh, space of, of loving kindness and friendliness and, and spaciousness, this is going to be a contentious week. I think everyone here is, um, I think we're all fortunate to be in a place where uh, we can see at least on some level, the value of spaciousness and, uh, and kindness over dogmatism. Um, so, yeah, I won't go into politics because, yeah, there's a list of 32 different things which a deep practitioner of the Dhamma, the Buddha said, uh, should not talk about so directly. One of them is Raja Kata. So talk about kings or talk about ministers, and so that's basically politics. It wasn't the best mouth noise, but uh, trying to indicate that, you know, not really leaning into that because um, as a Sangha, as representatives of the Buddhist teaching, uh, we don't want to get sectarian or partisan and be able to speak to everybody about dukkha, about suffering, unsatisfactoriness, and specifically how we cause ourselves to suffer and how we cause other people to suffer. And that can be fully figured out. That is what enlightenment is. It's fully figuring out the aspect of suffering which we cause ourselves, knowing fully how we do that, and then fully disengaging from that process and no longer doing those things which lead us to suffer ourselves. So and then being a, a beacon or a light of that into the world. So we won't talk about politics, but um, yeah, I would like to perhaps um, speak about a few useful uh, Buddhist principles for relating to talk about 
talk about politics or talk about um, yeah, that whole realm of society with which, like it or not, you know, the, the whole world is kind of aflame with, with views and opinions about um, the whole range of uh, ideas about uh, what's right and wrong in a political sphere. And so the Buddha, though he wouldn't specifically endorse one particular party or over another, um, he did speak directly to kings and ministers uh, about aspects of, of the heart. Um, yeah, some useful, useful things to consider. Um, maybe I'll just speak about um, two or three of them, which uh, are kind of bound up. They're almost meta, M-E-T-A, uh, single T, kind of overarching uh, second order or higher level um, ways with which we relate to the whole dialogue around, around politics. And yeah, you can say that, or one way of speaking, you could say that the most important decision, the most important ballot, or the most important vote that you're gonna cast in the next week isn't whatever you do on Tuesday, but is actually what each of us are doing right now and, and then right now. And yeah, it's, it's a, a rather provocative statement that the most important vote that we're gonna cast this week is not what we do on Tuesday, but what we're doing in every present moment. And it's provocative, not in the sense of trying to get someone to, to disagree with that, but more to just provoke everybody to turn inwards and actually look, what am I doing right now? What is my relationship to these different concepts? And what is my relationship to the people around me who have different uh, views around these topics? So one of the meta concepts to touch on is is just doubt. So doubt is one of the five hindrances, uh, which the Buddha said are hindrances, they're entanglements. And um, the Buddha actually used several words for doubt. So there's a very famous sutta where this group of people called the Kalamas came up to the Buddha. This was a place where lots of people had all sorts, there were teachers coming through saying, believe this, don't believe that, this is true, that's false. And the Kalamas came up to the Buddha like, we don't know what to believe. What do we believe? Some people say this, other people said that. And the Buddha says, you're in doubt about doubtful matters. And that's very much the case with political dialogue. And um, there is, yeah, a type of doubt which is really just uh, reflection. But the type of doubt which is a hindrance is that doubt which has no end. The type of doubt which no matter how much you doubt will never lead you to an end of doubting in that way. It's basically a, it's a way, a self-referential siloed way of thinking, which just leads to more and more suffering, it just does not lead you the way out. So you start to have more and more of a feel of what that is, what way of thinking just has no end. It's just proliferation. Um, yeah, just as there's arms proliferation, one side increases their weapon count and the other side increases their weapon count. And just the views and escalation just continues without, without end, mutually assured destruction. And that's when you get into this, when you fall into this habit of doubting in this unhelpful way of which there is a flavor, there is a, a way that it, this unhelpful doubt feels in the body. When you feel the tenseness and the us versus them mentality that's coming up, then what Buddhist meditation, or really any kind of meditation, can allow us to do is to get some remove. Actually, okay, I'm tensing up physically, I'm tensing up mentally, I'm tensing up doctrinally, and I just really need to chill out. It's not good for me, and it's not good for my, uh, the people around me who I care about. So that's one skill that we're, we're training in and learning how to do in, in meditation is just regardless of the accuracy, correctness of whatever I'm thinking about. I could be totally right about something, but it could be totally unhelpful. And when you realize that, then you have to see the usefulness, the utility of being able to disengage from that way of thinking, 
to be able to soften around it and just say, okay, I'm going to put that aside. This is just a loop of unhelpfulness. So coming back to the breath and remembering in those times just a place of serenity and with any big decision, any big decision that we're going to make, we have to be able to come to this place of, of clarity and stillness and moral clarity uh, because that's the only place from which we'll feel good in hindsight about our actions and in a way which there won't be this you know, kind of dark karmic imprint uh, upon ourselves and, and the people around us. So yeah, figuring out what is skillful discrimination, a helpful way of thinking about a, uh, a topic, which if you know how to meditate and can really calm the mind and relax the mind, relax the body to a place that actually leads you to a sense of clarity after some minutes, then you'll realize that that's a much better place to engage the issue from than a stirred up and hot and bothered and agitated and on fire inflamed mind state. So leaning into that, learning how to do that, seeing the value of this coolness of heart, coolness of heart, cool head, warm heart. That's what Ajahn Sona says. And so that's doubt, learning how to discriminate without this unhelpful doubting cycle. The opposite side of that is something the Buddha pointed to, which is the hindrance or the uh, obstruction of attachment to views, attachment to views, which is attachment to views. That's three words. Before finding it in a Buddhist sutta or hearing in a Buddhist talk, I had never heard those three words put together. Attachment to views. Attachment to views. But it's something that we do. And when you've got a name for it like that, attachment to views, clinging to views, clinging to opinions, just giving it a name like that, uh, you start to feel, oh, actually, maybe I do that. Maybe I do that a lot. And maybe it's not helpful. And the Buddha said, yeah, it's not helpful. Um, because it leads to this fixedness, this fixity, uh, where we lose cognitive flexibility. And in any relationship, especially a relationship with someone who disagrees with us, uh, which is arguably, yeah, it's being able to engage with people who disagree with us, that's really important. And you need flexibility. You need a softness and an empathy when entering into those conversations in a spaciousness. Um, that's really important. And when you label this, okay, this is attachment to views. I'm, I'm holding on to this. Um, and this needle needs to be threaded. It's not so easy because there is, in the Buddhist conception, a right view. There is right view. This is the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. So how can you have a right view and a detriment, a harm of attachment to views? And part of it is the view itself. So the right view that the Buddha is talking to in the Noble Eightfold Path is the view that this is dukkha. This is unsatisfactory. Looking at your own experience, being able to live, okay, this is dukkha. This is the cause of dukkha, i.e. some level of craving and attachment. Letting go of that is the end of dukkha, and the path leading to that leads to the end of that. Um, so, yeah, that's a right view. Um, but being able to hold even this right view in a way which hold an accurate view of the world without attaching to it. This is really important, and it's something that you can start to feel in the body as well, just as you can feel that unhe unhealthy, unhelpful, um, mutually unsupportive uh, way of doubting. So too you can feel the attachment of views just creeping in, and you certainly hear it more than just creeping into your conversations. It just pounces, and being able to disengage and actually leave a, a conversation if it started to, if you started to pounce, just say, yeah, this, it, it might not be the right time. You know, the uh, emotions are high right now. So doubt, figuring out a healthy relationship to that, figuring out a, a healthy relationship to attachment to views, figuring out what that means internally for yourself and how that affects your relationships. And fault finding. This is another two words. And you can separate it by a dash if you like. I do. I do like that. Um, you can do that. Fault finding. Another two words which are not well enough uh, used in common English parlance. Um, but this is something else which is 
unhealthy and unhelpful in a Buddhist context. Uh, the, there are various different Pali words which the Buddha used to point to this, this drawback. Um, one of them is uji, um, which literally means you're overthinking or ud, you're thinking into this, you're cogitating into this a bit, a bit too much and you're, you're faulting other people. And <laughs> the Buddha very bluntly uh, says he's got this very cool sutta, this very cool discourse where he's talking about different types of powers. So most people, if you've been around Buddhist circles for a while, you might be familiar with the five spiritual powers of uh, confidence, of mindfulness, of concentration, of energy, and of wisdom. So those are the common balas, these five spiritual powers. But the Buddha also talked about other types of powers, like the power of blamelessness. And in this kind of cool sutta, he talks about several other types of powers. He says that the power of a baby is crying. And that's true. That baby starts crying, you don't do anything. Especially if you're on an airplane. Oh my gosh. Um, and the Buddha said that the power, get ready, the power of a fool is fault finding. Oh, Buddha, way to go. So good, so good. The power of a fool is fault finding. And um, it's a very noteworthy aspect of Buddhist morality that it's not just about the rights and the wrongs. We recited the five precepts, which are really beautiful ways of living in the world. And when you live in a culture, a subculture that values these, like myself and like many people here, uh, myself having lived in monasteries for almost 20 years now, they're very safe places. I never think that it's a place where basically everyone, you can assume that when someone's talking to you, they're telling the truth. It's a very safe place and a very unique place in the world. These are very beautiful virtues, instantiated. But you need to watch out, the Buddha says in the Maha Asapura Sutta. Um, he says that you need to base these uh, ethical principles on a sense of not raising oneself up and disparaging others. So it's not true Buddhist morality, just refraining from killing. But if it's not Buddhist morality, if you don't kill, but you do exult, extol yourself and disparage others for killing. So you need to have this moral humility that says, oh, uh, the Buddha, it's, it's not about self. It's not about creating a me who's the best moral guy ever. Um, I have not killed anything, or at least I've been trying not to kill anything for however many years you've been doing it. I haven't been stealing and I'm the best for that. I haven't been doing sexual misconduct and I'm great and everybody else who does that is the worst. Um, you really need to see yourself, see how you do that, how you create this sense of uh, moral superiority and, and not do this. This is the, a foundation of Buddhist uh, ontology of the way things are is that these truths of dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, uh, the truth of impermanence, everything is impermanent, and everything is not self. And this is, a, this is the one especially where you can put a question mark behind that. Is there anything that's self in the world? And keep looking, and keep looking, and there's not, I've, yeah, maybe you'll find one, and that would be interesting. Um, but this is a basis of Buddhist morality as well. You don't want to build up a self, even if it's a really good self. Even if it's a really good self, you don't want to create this um, moral hierarchy in your mind that you're totally fixed to and really truly believe in. So this, these principles, figuring out how to doubt without being a slave to doubt, figuring out how to have a view without attaching to views, and figuring out how to not be a slave to fault finding, to have a very clear sense of moral integrity and sense of what causes harm to oneself and to one's immediate surroundings. And the saddest thing about 
uh, living an immoral life, is that you are most likely to hurt the people who are closest to you and who you care about most just because you're most interacting with them. And that just that applies both to the gross harms that you're avoiding by keeping the five precepts. You know, not, you're certainly not killing or stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, uh, but also the realm of, of speech and just how you're relating to the people around you. So just say, Karuna, just please, everyone, I hope you can all hold very, very big hearts because that's mature. You've come across these really wise, these wise teachings from the Buddha and they're advocating a sense of spaciousness and not everyone hears that. Everyone, so many people hear an encouragement to just the opposite. You need to more and more drill down into how I'm right and everyone else is wrong. This is a stock phrase in the Pali Canon where the Buddha car uh, car makes this statement about some, some people think only this is true and everything else is wrong. Whereas a practitioner doesn't fall for that. You just don't fall for that line of thinking. So, yeah, karuna, please, everyone, uh, see how these different types of attachment and fault-finding just hurt yourself and hurt the people around you, and please have a very spacious and uh, warm, cool head and warm heart week, and maybe in the talk there. <laughs> Sadhu, 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 anumotami. Okay, so we'll open things up for a, a period of questions or if people had comments. Um, hopefully, do we have a mic runner? Yep, Jayanta, great. And also people on Zoom, if you have questions, you can raise that little cartoon hand as well. Um, in NVC, they talk about <clears throat> playing the game of who's right versus uh, making life wonderful. Um, I'll try not to point it at the speaker. <clears throat> yeah, so I was thinking of that as you were talking, playing the game of who's right. Uh, yesterday, I found myself in the conference room with people with more decision-making power than me at, at work. And um, am I closer? Yeah, yeah that's why we're going to Okay. Um, <clears throat> and it seemed like there were basically two um, options being discussed. One is uh, a default policy of telling customers what they want to hear, even if it might not be true to optimize business profits. And the other policy is, uh, which was gently suggested by me, <laughs> of uh, maybe we could have a default policy of telling the truth. <laughs> and uh, basically, just on the, yeah, trying to keep the fourth precept, finding myself in this situation, any advice coming to mind about navigating, you know, gently, you know, preserving harmony and but also my own integrity, and uh, yeah, be respectful, but also uncompromising on the fourth precept. Yeah. Could you say the name of that game again from nonviolent communication? It's a. Uh... Hmm. Oh. <laughs> uh, the game we all enjoy to play is uh, making life wonderful for one another, but the game we often end up playing is who's right where everybody loses. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Jeremy. Um, yeah, it's a great point. And um, certainly that first option of just telling, trying to predict what a customer will like and then telling them that um, makes me think back. I had reason sometime in the not too distant past to have like an hours long conversation with T-Mobile. And uh, the guy at the end of it told me that he liked my voice. And I have to say, I was very, I was very touched, honestly. I'm like, T-Mobile is a great company. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that as a public policy. And certainly, like, being truthful is very useful. Um, 
But this, when we recite that fourth precept of I undertake the precept to refrain from lying, the older version of this chanting book said had a broader translation, which isn't actually right polywise, but it is right with the spirit of right speech, which the older translation was I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. And what that adding that extra line of harmful speech did is include the three other aspects of right speech. So four aspects of right speech, right speech being the third factor of the Eightfold Path, is refraining from lying, refraining from harsh speech, refraining from uh, gossip, and refraining from idle chatter. And I think a useful policy would really be to go into the depths of that fully maintaining that first precept, but also looking deeply into that second one of avoiding harsh speech, because the Buddha did both speak about it in the negative. I, yeah, one can undertake the precept to refrain from harsh speech, but he also talked about it in the positive, that one can speak politely, words which are um, not coarse, words which are agreeable, and yeah, words which are soft. There's a list of about six things um, which the Buddha went into, and that's really useful as well. Um, the Buddha did say that there are times uh, when it can be right to speak harshly. I wouldn't, I don't know if like, if you're just calling somebody out on the phone, if you look, work for T-Mobile and you know, there's probably not a time for uh, you know, reprimanding somebody for whatever their choice of cell provider is. But um, uh, yeah, but there is a place, like speaking to your child. If they run out in the street and they're not old enough to understand kind and true words, there is a place for speaking harshly. It's one of our monastic rules, both for bhikkhus, monks, and bhikkhunis, nuns, is that we don't speak harshly. But there is a non-offense clause. If you're a teacher and you have a very clear and honest um, intention that is to avoid the harm of uh, the student, you are allowed to speak harshly if it's a very clear intention. Um, and not a co-opted intention. So look deeply into that, and I could point you in the direction of, I think, the Potalia Sutta in the Majima, Majima number 54? Yeah. Uh, goes into exactly what harsh speech means. So, yeah, trying to do those two things. Uh, fault finding. It, it seemed to me that looking at myself, honestly, I do what I think you're describing as fault finding, but I feel like I'm doing it to understand and to gain maybe some insight or wisdom. So maybe it's the semantics of what is fault finding, but could you clarify fault finding looking at yourself? Yeah, it's a very good point. And uh, the poly words are better because you usually they can be extremely valent towards the wholesome or towards the unwholesome. So um, here, the type of fault finding that you're seeing, i.e. being able to see faults, being able to have the discernment. I mean, that's an aspect of wisdom or panya, being able to discern accurately, having the critical mind that can accurately see. That would be unhelpful. This would be helpful. This would be harmful. That would be unharmful. Like that's, that is wisdom. That is growth on the path, being able to do that. But the compulsion to not be able to control that and just to have it bleeding out onto the people around one in a way which is out of control and harmful, which unfortunately is, might even be the norm in many subs, you know, societies. So um, yeah, it's <laughs> one other place it comes up in is, is in our rules. We have a rule that um, we have 30 rules specifically about table manners. So one of our table manners is that I will not look at another monk's bowl like they're, where they, what they're eating out of with a fault-finding mind. So that's the type of mind you're avoiding is yeah, this judgmental. I think judgmental is a good word because in English, it's, you can kind of discern, oh, this is a judgmental mind. And when you actually look at it, there's, not, there's a definitely a place for judgment discernment in a Buddhist context, in a wisdom context, in any kind of intelligent life uh, is to have judgment, to make judgments, but being judgmental is unwholesome. And I think that's what 
is good to be able to flag, oh, this is judgmentalism, and I'm trapped by it, actually. I'm seeing the world through boiling water. Everything that I see right now, if it's remotely um, negatively valenced, I'm going to hate. That's why we say uh, in a monastery, you don't uh, admonish someone before the meal uh, because we're hungry, and you don't admonish people the day after the all-night vigil because we're tired, and we're likely to be biased in what we're, how we're seeing the world. We see through our own pain, our own pain kind of um, biases how we see the world. So is that, is that helpful? Um, you're talking about attached to the view, and it's a fine line between attached to the view and protected the truth, satta nuraksa. So it's um, sometimes it's very close to that. How can we make the clear cut? This is attached to the view, or this is we try to protect the truth. Yeah, really great, great question. So if you're here for the first or second time, uh, I talk a lot of Pali, and uh, yeah, I hope everybody's okay with that. Um, so the, the word for attachment to views uh, takes the Pali word upadana, which is, can mean clinging or attachment, but can also mean feeding. It can also mean feeding, and it's when you find that you're feeding off of this view versus Ajahn Nisibo makes this really great distinction that in one's interaction with the world, you don't want to be feeding off of the world. You don't want to be feeding off of the people around you in codependent relationships. You want to be blessing the world. And this is also a, uh, yeah, a feeling that you can feel. You can feel it in your face. Um, am I feeding off of the world or am I blessing the world? And yeah, maybe that language will help you be able to see more like is this view something that I can't put down? The Buddha gives this image of like a dog chewing on a bone, and there's no more meat left on the bone. It's just obsessively chewing on the bone because there's some smell of a little bit of meat deep down in the marrow of that bone, and it just keeps gnawing away at it. And unfortunately, that's how we relate too much to too many of our, our thoughts and opinions. It's just our habit. We've been for so long, so many lifetimes. Yeah. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah. And yet, protecting the truth, such on Uraka, um, whew, it is a fine line. It really is a fine line. And I think, look at your own heart and how, is your heart on fire or is your heart warm? Maybe look at that. Yeah. Ajahn, thank you for the beautiful talk. Um, I have a question. So you mentioned that the power of a fool is fault finding, and then I remember the Buddha, some disciple of Buddha asked, what is the best blessing of all? And then the Buddha mentioned not to associate with fools is the best blessing. I'm coming from my memory. So could you please tell a little bit more about fools according to the Buddha. So I'm asking this question so that I do not become one and try to protect myself from the ones. Sorry. What other fool-related things comes to your mind? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of foolishness. Um, but one very useful thing, you know, is mentioning this truth of not self that you always need. When the Buddha will talk about self, he will use first-person pronouns, third-person pronouns. He, she, they, you, me, talking about himself and talking about others, just because that's how all of us pretty much all the time see each other and relate to the world. Um, but he will also talk about fools or wise people. And what is a fool? A fool is someone who repeatedly acts in foolish ways, speaks in foolish ways, thinks in foolish ways. So there's, at the beginning of the Anguttara 3s, 3.1 through 3.10, the Buddha defines fool in different ways like this. The Buddha, uh, a fool does, uh, un, or does blameworthy actions by body, speech, or mind. Um, so I, I would recommend looking there and always 
yeah, really, if the Buddha does speak like that, that is the sutta on the highest blessings. The first thing that he mentions as a highest blessing is uh, avoiding those foolish ways, which is a very euphemistic, very kind English translation for don't associate with fools, don't hang out with fools, is the, the Pali. Um, but you really do need to lead, read into that, that people who are acting foolishly, so realizing that he's always talking about actions that we and other people are doing, so not doing those ourselves. And yeah, if someone, and we're all a mixed bag, we're all a mixed bag of foolishness and, uh, and wisdom and inclining towards, leaning towards making friends with the parts of ourselves that are the wise ones. You can give justice. Okay. <clears throat> Could you make a distinction, please, in the Pali for the uh, third precept um, for Kame Sumi Chachara or Sutta Abhamacharya? And does that, does that extend beyond sexual misconduct in general, like more indulging in sensual pleasures? Um, it can. It really depends on how you want to hold it. Like these, these five precepts are great because they're somewhat black and white when you read them on the paper. I will not kill, it's black and white. Uh, I will not steal, take that which has not been given. I will not commit sexual misconduct. In a Buddhist context that means uh, entering into relationships which are mutually agreed upon with people who are consenting. Um, so, yeah, but the literal word is kama, so misconduct with regards to sensuality. So some teachers, if you've got the five aspects of the physical gestures that you're not doing, you're no longer killing, you're no longer stealing, you're no longer doing sexual misconduct, you're no longer letting lies come out of your lips, you're no longer taking intoxicants. These are all, in a Pali context, Buddhist Theravada context, precepts are physical actions that you're refraining from but you can take the principles into a mental level. So to say categorically, I will refrain from sensual misconduct is a bar which I think probably none of us are able to say that I will clearly never do that because the lines, food is an aspect of sensuality and we all have to eat. And when do you cross that line of it being misconduct? Maybe that's clear for some people, but it's not clear for a lot of people but getting more and more clarity around that, like when is this misconduct with regards to sensuality? When am I, yeah, if I've got a, um, an idea that this is an, a teaching from Dharma punks of extreme monogamy, extreme monogamy, where not only am I not going to have sexual relationships outside of someone who's my partner or for a monastic, our monogamy is just celibacy, you know, a relationship with the, the Sangha, um, extreme monogamy is I'm not even if a thought comes up a sensual thought about someone else who I'm attracted to comes up I'm not going to fuel that thought which is kind of beautiful but thoughts are much subtler to track than our physical actions we have much more capacity to say I'm not going to stab someone I'm not going to steal this thing than to say oh here's a thought of no that's that guy's fine or whatever it is you know just not going there, thoughts are so fast that you have to, um, you have to train into that. Yeah. That gentleman back there. And I think this might be the last question. So you were talking about moral hierarchy and like there's a lot in, the spiritual community um, that claim spirituality but don't live it in the day to day. So how do we avoid this trap? It has complete more and more integrity. So I think it was Emerson talked about a moral sense or living a beautiful life is one where what we do, what we say, and what we think are all completely of a piece. They're all one piece together. And that's what the Buddha said. There's one of the names of the Buddha is the Tathagata, which means 
one of the meanings of that is as one as he says, so he does. So that's what we're inclining towards. But that's a lot harder than, yeah, as you say, I mean, it's for, for any of us, especially like if you're going to wear some Buddhist paraphernalia, like you wear like your Buddhist hat or something, you're kind of putting yourself out there as a, yeah, a representative of Buddhism. And that's what we do. We, we're basically wearing a flag, and it is a rectangle. Uh, you know, it says, I'm a Buddhist practitioner, so we have more of a responsibility to be representatives of what the Buddha is teaching, but we're by ourselves. We live in huts by ourselves, and nobody knows there's no camera in there. That would be very weird. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad Ajahn Nisabo has not installed a camera in my hut. Um, but yeah, I mean, we all have to work in that direction, and having people who we can um, go to and having a community of people who are trying to keep the same precepts as us we can check in because we do break these precepts. We got, yeah, um, you have as many rules as you take on. And other people who are trying to do that as well are the perfect people to have conversations on how to keep doing them. And if you do smudge it or you do fudge it or whatever kind of breaking a precept, then you can talk to someone you trust about that. So, yeah, really good question. Thank you.